Hi, my name is Miss Stapleton. This is a revision video for memory, the year one topic on the AQA specification, the new specification for teaching uh, exams in 2016. So this is the memory specification. I'm just going to quickly run through each of the bullet points in the specification, uh, just plugging in a few bits of key knowledge, but not going over anything in any great amount of detail. Okay, so the first topic on the specification is the multi-store model of memory, including the sensory register, short-term memory, and long-term memory. And for each of those stores, you also have to be able to make reference to coding, capacity, and duration within those stores. So hopefully you recognize the model on the board as the multi-store model of memory. So you have the stimulus from the environment coming into the sensory register. From the sensory register, information that's paid attention to can enter into short-term memory. And from short-term memory, through a process of uh, maybe maintenance rehearsal originally or later elaborative rehearsal it can then enter into long-term memory. And of course there's um, forgetting, if you like, that can occur at each stage. So within the sensory register you're looking at decay, within short-term memory you're looking at um, decay and displacement, and within long-term memory primarily you're looking at the two types of forgetting that we'll refer to later on, which is retrieval failure and auto uh, interference. Okay, just to note with the multi-store model of memory, the original multi-store model of memory um, had maintenance rehearsal from short-term memory to long-term memory, which was later changed to elaborative rehearsal. So that's just a bit of extra detail there you could add into the model. Okay, so what you need to know, like I said, in respect to each of the stores is capacity, um, duration, and coding with each of these stores. So I'll just talk a moment about the duration. So, Within the sensory register, um, Sperling's experiment shows that the sensory register has a duration, a very, very short duration, of about half a second. A uh, short-term memory, the Peterson-Peterson experiment, shows that it's about 18 seconds. And then long-term memory, Barrick's research shows that long-term memory has a pretty much infinite duration in terms of how long the memory lasts, which is what um, duration means. Okay. The next thing you need to know is capacity. Capacity is how much it can hold. Now, within the sensory register, although it's got a very, very limited duration of like half a second, Sperling also showed it had a large capacity. It's just hampered by that very, very short duration. Um, Short-term memory uh, tends to fall somewhere around kind of Miller's magic number of seven, um, kind of uh, seven plus or minus two. Uh, so between five to nine items, which is what earlier research by Jacobs had found as well. Uh, within long-term memory, the research um, from Linton showed an enormous capacity for long-term uh, memory. Indeed, it's not really kind of quantifiable because it's so large the capacity. In terms of coding, the sensory register is coded depending upon essentially the sense that it derives from. So in that sense, it's what we call modality specific. So uh, information coming into the visual sensors and encoded visually, things that you hear are coded acoustically. And there are other sensors as well, um, kind of like um, haptic or olfactory in terms of what you smell. Badly to a lot of research in respect of coding in short-term memory, long-term memory. And what you found is in short-term memory, the primary form of encoding, not to say absolute, was acoustic, and in long-term memory, uh, the code encoding was semantic. Now, there's lots and lots of um, AO3 that you can use for the multi-store model of memory. In a sense, what you could do is any, use any of those studies in terms of duration, capacity, coding, that would support that these memory stores are separate kind of unitary stores, which is what the model said. You could also use... Um, KF to kind of undermine the multi-store model of memory a bit because what KF showed us that it was kind of uh, it was it was possible to damage part of your short-term memory, which of course if short-term memory is just one thing, like the model says, then this shouldn't be possible. Uh, Logie did some research saying that uh, a lot of the time short-term memory actually relies on long-term memory in order to work, so in a sense these can't be two separate systems, and then Finally, the research, the case study into HM, shows that it is possible to damage um, the long-term memory, but the short-term memory remained intact, um, just looking at areas of the hippocampus, which shows that these are separate stores and also seem to be located in separate areas within the brain. Okay, now the next part of the specification then is the types of long-term memory. So, 
What you need to be able to refer to is procedural, semantic, and episodic. And the first distinction you probably, probably need to make within long-term memory is the difference between implicit and explicit memory. So implicit memories are the things you do, the procedural things that do not require conscious attention. You do not be, have to be aware of the process of doing them, if you like. Whereas the explicit memories do require conscious, conscious attention in order to access them. So very quickly, uh, the episodic memory... Um, Episodic memories tend to have a very strong emotional context to them as like, so very personal events or memories that you have. So, for example, your first day of school, and the memory of that is likely to bring up lots of associated emotions with that. Um, semantic memories tend to be like uh, knowledge or facts that you know. So unlike episodic memory, they don't have a strong emotional attachment with them. And then the procedural memory is essentially how to do things. And like I said, this is memory that doesn't require conscious attention. So you get on a bike and you automatically know how to do it because it's something that you have learned. So it's the result of practice that becomes automatic. Now, there is loads and loads of evidence that you could use from brain scans to support the fact that episodic procedure and semantic are different types of long-term memory, which involves people taking part in recollection of certain memories that are episodic procedure and semantic, and it seems to be they're located at different areas within the brain. And it's also possible to damage parts of long-term memory. So, for example, it's possible perhaps to damage the episodic memory but leave the other parts of the memory intact, which does suggest that these parts of long-term memory are different. Okay, so the working memory model is the second model of memory you need to know. And please don't get these two models of memory confused, so the multi-star model and the working memory model. So this was, of course, the later model. So it is, remember, primarily apart from if we kind of link in the episodic buffer a little bit to long-term memory, a model of how short-term memory works. So there's a number of things that you need to know. So you've got the episodic buffer at the top, which is going to direct all the attention. So essentially, the information coming into short-term memory is going to decide where it goes. And it's going to go primarily one of two places. It's going to go to the visuospatial sketchpad, or it's going to go to the phonological loop, depending on the type of information that it is. So if it's visual information or navigational information, it's going to go to the visual spatial sketchpad. And if it's verbal acoustic information, it's going to go to the phonological loop. Now, later on, and that's what we put on the board, 1986 versus 2000, the episodic buffer was added in. This was added in because what the episodic buffer can do is lots of really good things. It can act as a backup to the central executive, because of course the central executive has no storage capacity yet, has a big job to do in terms of directing attention. It can provide a link into long-term memory as well, and it can also bring together um, phonological and uh, sorry, it can also bring together the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketchpad as well. So the 2000 model is the addition of the episodic buffer. Now. In terms of the um, evaluation for the working memory model, there's lots and lots of things you could look at. Um, so, for example, with the central executive, there's information that looks at brain scans that shows almost the central executive in action, if you like, when participants are doing dual tasks. Um, you can also use KF here, because although KF undermined the multi store model, it supports uh, the working memory model which says that you could theoretically be able to damage part of short-term memory because the visual spatial sketchpad of phonological loop are different. Uh, Badley's done a lot of research into the episodic buffer and for the phonological loop you can look at the word length effect again by Badley. Uh, there are some criticisms as well which are worth noting in terms of the working memory model. A lot of them really centred around the idea of the central executive and how and what, essentially, it is um, research suggested that the central executive should be further subdivided into several different things. Um, methodologically, there's things you could talk about, for example, the use of case studies um, to, um, the use of case studies to research the model and the idiographic nature of those case studies, and also experiments used to support the model, the artificial nature of those experiments. Okay, the next part of the specification is the explanations for forgetting. And there's two explanations of forgetting that it refers to, uh, interference theory and retrieval failure due to absence of cues. So, interference theory is essentially, um, when we think of the working, sorry, see I did it then, think of the multi-store model of memory, the last bit of the multi-store model of memory is that long-term memory. It talks about losing information through interference. And interference tends to happen when you get two bits of information and you confuse them with one another. And interference is more likely to happen when the information is similar to each other. 
And there's a couple of types of interference that you have to know. Proactive interference and retroactive interference. And also I try to think of some technique to not get these two confused because they will interfere with one another. So proactive interference is when old information prevents the recall of newer information. So perhaps if you go on holiday to Spain and you know you should be driving on the right hand side of the road but you end up driving on the left hand side of the road. Retroactive information is the reverse and when that's the recent information gets in the way of the old information. So perhaps after you come back from Spain what you then find is you're driving on the right hand side of the road when you should be driving reversely on the left hand side of the road. Now this research on here, I'm not going to go through this research by Underwood and Schmidt that illustrate these two types for getting two different pieces of research. Um, the AO3, is, it's in quite a lot of detail on the board behind me, but just to kind of run through it. Um, the, I mean, this points to a lot of kind of criticisms about memory that we talked to about the artificial nature of the research. Things like remembering word lists aren't necessarily something that we're going to do in everyday life. So in a sense, uh, the method employed often lacks mundane realism. Uh, and again, these are cognitive explanations, and the issue with cognitive explanations is it's difficult for us to understand and see how these cognitive processes work in the brain, so it's almost like more research needs to be done in this area. Um, and although interference theory is a good theory of forgetting, it can't attack out for all types of forgetting, which is why we often use retrieval failures due to absence of cues as another explanation. Uh, but there is real-world application to this theory. Um, a lot of research has been done into adverts in terms of the order of presentation of things to encourage you to remember them. Okay, so the next one is the retrieval failure due to the absence of cues. And this is based on the encoding specificity principle by Tulby, which, event, which essentially says that um, when you remember something, you don't just remember the thing that you're trying to remember, you take in lots of different information at that time as well. You take in environmental things in terms of where you are, in terms of what you can smell, and also things in relation to even the mood that you're in at the time. So the best way of remembering something is to essentially put yourself back in essentially as close to that situation as possible. So there's two types of forgetting that we see that are associated with retrieval failure. This context-dependent forgetting and state-dependent forgetting. Context-dependent forgetting is to do with the environmental cues and state-dependent is essentially to do with your mood. Now, there is some really interesting pieces of research that you can use with the AO3 for these types of forgetting. Um, for context-dependent uh, forgetting, there's research that looks at remembering something in one room, forgetting it, and then returning to the room to try and remember it again. Uh, for state dependent, there is um, pieces of research that are ethically a little bit questionable that ask people to hide money whilst high on marijuana and find that they're much better at finding it again if they are high again, so return to the state they're originally in. And um, there was some interesting research that looked at divers learning material either underwater or on dry land and found they were much more effective in recording that material if they were either underwater or on dry land again. Okay, the next part of the specification is about the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Be careful that there are three factors here that you have to know. So there's leading questions, post-event discussion and anxiety. And leading questions and post-event discussion fall under this term. If you see in the specification, they're called misleading information. Now, there's loads and loads of different pieces of research into the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. And you probably noticed that a lot of them are attributed to the same person, which is Elizabeth Loftus. So there is the um, verb study that looked at the effectiveness of language used. Added on to that, there was the variation of the broken glass. And there was also the stop yield study, which looked about the consistency of the questioning. So it's just a, it's for you a matter of kind of knowing the procedures and finding those pieces of research in relation to those two factors, essentially, for the misleading information. Um, for the evaluation of this, um, I think it's a good thing to draw in the research from Yuli and Kutschel, which looked at the real-life bank robbery, which showed that in real life, um, things like leading question actually have less of an effect than Loftus had perhaps originally thought um, using the experiment. There have been some really important real-world applications in terms of the criminal justice system, in terms of things like the questioning that police use that we'll come on to when we look at the cognitive interview in a moment. 
Um, but there are kind of other variables that could be responsible. For example, age has been shown to be something that also influences the accuracy of eyewitness testimony in terms of looking at the differences between young people and old people and kind of the ones in the middle. So different susceptibility to things like leading questions. So um, the research with anxiety points to kind of a positive and also a negative effect on anxiety. And of course, you can again use Loftus in this if you like. Uh, the reason that it points to a positive and negative effect is something called the yerkes dobson law, which said that anxiety, if you like, like many things, has this optimum level. So to have a little bit of anxious arousal could actually increase the accuracy of your eyewitness testimony, but too much accuracy is going to decrease the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So just be aware when, if you're going to do a big, say, 12 or 10 or 8 mark question on anxiety, that it's a little bit weighted on either side in terms of if it has a positive effect or does it have a negative effect. And again, you can use Julian Kutchlaw here as part of your AO3. The next part of the spec is improving the accuracy of the eyewitness testimony. And this is essentially about the cognitive interview. So any question that asks you about how to improve the accuracy of the eyewitness testimony is a question on the cognitive interview. Okay, so the cognitive interview, I'm sure you're aware of, has four different parts to it. There is report everything, there is reinstatement of the context, uh, changing the order and changing the perspective. With the cognitive interview, it's important that you know how to use each one of these to generate a question. So for example, uh, if you were going to generate a question based on changing the order, you might ask in an interview for the person to start at the thing that happened last and recall everything that happened in reverse order. Or perhaps think about something uh, from a different person's perspective, tell me what they saw, tell me what they heard. So the cognitive interview, the goal of it, if, is, if you like, is to say as little as possible from the interviewer to get as much as possible out of the person that you're interviewing. Because as human beings, we've been socialised into not saying a lot, so the cognitive interview is designed to help you say as much as possible. Now, there is, uh, obviously there's evaluation for everything because you need to know evaluation for everything. Uh, the most interesting thing about the cognitive interview, perhaps, in terms of the evaluation is, although it is used by police forces, they tend to cherry-pick the bits of the cognitive interview that they want to use. It's also used worldwide, and it's been used in countries as well, and I think like Brazil that have perhaps employed things like torture before, and have actually found the cognitive interview to be a lot more successful, which is, of course, um, brilliant for things like human rights. Um, one of the things as well that you have to ensure with the cognitive interview, of course, is the person that's delivering knows exactly what they're doing, otherwise it's going to kind of impede the process of it. Okay, that's it. So that was a very quick run through in terms of memory and I hope you found it useful.